And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And, he, and God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's a walloping statement to put in there at the end of those three sentences. I mean, the therefore comes as somewhat of a surprise, but there's an injunction there. Well, it's a good injunction, man. You, I'll tell you, people who don't do that, they have a hell of a time in their marriage. And so this is a good thing to know if you are married or if you're planning to get married. It's like, you know, we have very strong orientation towards our parents, and for good reason. It's like the injunction here is that's secondary as soon as you're married. And, and failure to do that makes your marriage collapse. And then you deserve it to collapse too, as far as I'm concerned, because it's a reflection of your pathological immaturity and your unwillingness to extract yourself from the, you know, talon-like grip of parents who are a little bit too much on the interfering side. But the injunction, there's, there's a deep injunction here. It's very complicated. So one of the ideas is that the original Adam wasn't a man, like, a separate man. It was more like a hermaphroditic being. And in that hermaphroditic being, there was a kind of per undifferentiated perfection. And then that was split into male and female. And then that part of the goal of human beings is to reunite that as the singular unity that reestablishes the initial perfection. And that's actually the goal of marriage from a spiritual perspective. And you could read about that if you read Jung, because he wrote quite a bit about that. It's lovely. It's such a good idea. So... I had these friends that went to Sweden to get married. They were, northern, they were from northern Alberta, but his heritage, they're both their heritages were Swede, Swedish. And in this ceremony, they did this cool thing as they, they were being married, and they had to hold a candle up between them, right, while they were being married. And you think, well, okay, what's the candle? Well, it's a source of light. It's a source of illumination, right? It's a source of enlightenment. It's the candle that you put on Christmas trees in, in Europe. So it's the light that emerges in the darkness in the depth of winter. It's a symbol of life in, in, in darkness. It's the reemergence of the sun at the, at the darkest, coldest time of the year, which is also associated symbolically with the, re, with the birth of Christ for all sorts of complicated reasons. And so the candle's all that. And then the next question is, why do you hold it above you? And the answer is, because what's above you is what you're below to. So it single, simplifies something transcendent. And so why do you both hold on to it? Well, because you're both supposed to hold on to the light Right? And you're supposed to be subordinate to the light. And so you ask, well, who's in charge in a marriage? Well, the light. That's the idea. So you come together as one thing. You're no longer two things. It isn't what's good for you, and it's not what's good for your wife. It's what's good for the marriage. And the marriage is about the combined being, which is the reassembly of the original hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic being at the beginning of time. That's the idea. And that's all packed into like these four sentences. And, you know, there's been, well, all of these sentences have tremendous history of interpretation associated with them, right? It's just endless and endless and endless, and that's one of the lines. And so it's also an antidote to the idea that women taken out of men, which is obviously the reverse of the biological process, by the way, makes women in some sense subordinate to men. That is not built into this text. I don't see that at, at all as built into the text. And there's something else that's associated with it, too, and there's an idea that... Um, you know, in, in, in Sleeping Beauty, you know, Sleeping Beauty goes to sleep. And the reason she goes to sleep is because you, you have to remember what happens is she has parents who are quite old. And so they're pretty desperate to have a child, like so many people are now. And they only have one child, like so many people do now. And they, they don't want anything to happen to this child. Because like, hey, it's a miracle. And there's only one of them. And so and she's the princess. And so it's like, we're not letting anything around her. So they have a big christening party, right? And they invite everybody. But they don't invite Maleficent. And Maleficent is the terrible mother. She's nature. She's like the thing that goes bump in the night. She's the devil herself, so to speak. She's everything that you don't want your child to encounter. So the king and queen saying, well, we just won't invite her to the christening. It's like, well, good luck with that. <laughs> That's an Oedipal story, right? The Oedipal mother is the mother who devours her child by refusing by overprotecting him or her, so that instead of being strengthened by an encounter with the terrible world, they're weakened by too much protection, and then when they're let out into the world, they cannot live. 
And that's the story of Sleeping Beauty, and that's what the king and queen do. And they apologize to, the, to Maleficent when she first shows up. And say, well, you know, they have a bunch of half-witted excuses why they don't invite her. We forgot. It's like, I don't think so. You know, you don't forget something like that. And she kind of makes that point. It's right, the whole horror of life. You don't forget about that when you have a child, that's for sure. You might wish that it would stay at bay, but you do not forget about it. The question is, do you invite it to the party? And the answer is, it bloody well depends how unconscious you want your child to be. And if you want your child to be unconscious, well, then you have the added advantage that maybe they won't leave home. And so you can take advantage of them for the rest of your sad life instead of going off to find something to do for yourself. Well, and then, of course, you can take revenge on them if they do have any, any what would you call, impetus towards courage that you sacrificed yourself 30 years ago and want to stamp out as soon as you see it develop in your child. That's another thing that would be quite pleasant. And so that's what happens in Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, well, none of this is pleasant, and nothing that happens in that story is pleasant. So Sleeping Beauty, she's naive as hell. They put her out in the forest and have her raised by these three, like, goody-two-shoes fairies that are also completely devoid of any real potency and power, right? There's no, nothing maleficent about them. And then the first idiot prince that wanders by, she falls in love with so badly that she has post-traumatic stress disorder when he rides off on his horse, right? That's what happens. And then she, then she goes into the castle and she's all freaked out because she met the love of her life for like five minutes, for God's sake. And, you know, that's when the spinning wheel, that's the wheel of fate, pops up and she pricks her finger, right? They try to get rid of all the spinning wheels. They try to get rid of all the wheels of fate with their pointed end. But she finds it, poke, pricks her fingers and finger and falls down unconscious. Well, she wants to be unconscious. And no bloody wonder. She was protected her whole life. She's so damn naive that her first love affair just about kills her. She wants to go to sleep and never wake up. And so that's exactly what happens. And then she has to wait for the prince to come and rescue her. Well, you think, how sexist can you get that story? Well, seriously, because that's... That's the way that that would be read in, in, in the modern world. It's like she doesn't need a prince to rescue her. That's why Disney made Frozen that absolutely appalling piece of rubbish. <laughs> so, you know, you can say, you can say, well, the princess doesn't need a prince to rescue her, but, you know, that's a boneheaded way of looking at the story because the prince isn't just a man who's coming to rescue the woman. And believe me, he's got his own problems, right? He's got a whole goddamn dragon he has to contend with. But, <laughs> but the prince also represents the woman's own consciousness. The consciousness is presented very frequently in stories as symbolically masculine, as it is with the Logos idea. And the idea is that without, without that forward-going, courageous consciousness a woman herself will drift into unconsciousness and terror. And so you can read it as, well, the woman who's sleeping needs a man to wake her up. And of course, just like a man needs a woman to wake him up, it's the same damn thing. That's the dragon fight in Sleeping Beauty. But it's also the case that if she's only unconscious, all she can do is lay there and sleep, like the, the sleep of the naive and damned. She has to wake, and, wake herself up and, 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 and bring her own consciousness, her own masculine consciousness into the forefront so that she can survive in the world. And of course, women are trying to do that like mad, but that's partly what's represented in a story like that. And that's partly what's implicit in this idea, is that unless the woman is taken out of man, so to speak, then she isn't a human being, she's just a creature. And that's partly what's embedded in this story. So you don't want to read it as a patriarchal... You don't want to read anything that way. It's so... Really, it's... It really, it's... Yeah, I won't, I won't bother with that. But really, we can do better than that, man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. It's like, yeah. Thing, the other thing about marriage, this is really worth knowing too, is that I, re I learned this in part from reading Jung. It's like, what do you do when you get married? That's easy. You take someone who's just as useless and horrible as you are, and then you shackle yourself to them. And then you say, we're not running away, no matter what happens. Yeah, well, that, that's perfect, because then you don't get to run away. And the thing is, is like, if you can run away, you can't tell each other the truth. Because if you tell someone the truth about you and they don't run away, they weren't listening. And so if you don't have someone around that can't run away, then you can't tell them the truth. And so that's part of the purpose of the marriage. It's like, okay, okay, I'll bet on you, you bet on me. It's a losing bet, we both know that. But <laughs> given our current circumstances, we're unlikely to find anyone better. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, 
There are two things that come off of that. One is, you know, people are waiting around to find Mr. or Mrs. Right. It's like, here's something to think about, man, to put yourself on your feet right. If you went to a party and you found Mr. Right, and he looked at you and didn't run away screaming, that would indicate that he wasn't Mr. Right at all. Right? It's like the old Nietzschean joke. Uh, if someone loves you, that should immediately disenchant you with them. <laughs> right, right. Or it's the Woody Allen joke. I never belonged to a club that would take me as a member. So, so that's, a, that's an interesting, that's a very interesting thing to think about. And so you're going to shackle yourself to someone who's just as, imp as imperfect as you are. And then the issue is you, you, you might be in a situation where you can actually negotiate. Because you might think, well, there's some things about you that aren't going so right. And there's some things about me that aren't going so right. And we're bloody well stuck with the consequences for the next 50 years. So we can, we can either straighten this out or we can suffer through it for the next five decades. And you know, people are of the sort that without that degree of seriousness, those problems will not be solved. You'll leave things unnamed, because there's always an out. It's like, and it's the same thing when you're living together with someone. You know that people who live together before they're married are more likely to get divorced, not less likely. And the reason for that is, what exactly are you saying to one another when you live with each other? Just think about it. Well, for now, <laughs> You're better than anything else I can trick. <laughs> but I'd like to reserve the right to trade you in. <laughs> Conveniently, if someone better happens to stumble into me. <laughs> well, how could, how could someone not be insulted to their core by an offer like that? Now, they're willing to play along with it because they're going to do the same thing with you. <laughs> now, well, that's exactly it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know, you're not going to commit to me, so that means you don't value me or our relationship above everything else. But as long as I get to escape if I need to, then I'm willing to put up with that. It's like, that's a hell of a thing. I mean, you might think, how stupid is it to shackle yourself to someone? It's like, it's stupid, man. There's no doubt about that. But compared to the alternatives, it's pretty damn good. Because without that shackling, there are things you will never, ever learn. Because you'll avoid them. You can always leave. And if you can leave, then you don't have to tell each other the truth. It's as simple as that, because you can just leave. And then you don't have anyone you can tell the truth to.